Good evening, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Bible study. I'm Pastor Tanya, and I'm excited that you are with us tonight. I'll give you all a few minutes to come on in and join us. Welcome to Bible study. Hi, Michelle. I saw a picture of those beautiful girls. I miss you all. Give y'all just a second to join us. Let us know that you are here. Let me know that you're in the virtual building for putting something in the chat. All right. All ready, all ready, all ready. All right, we're going to continue um, in the book of Mark. Uh, we have been journeying in the book of Mark um, in, with a theme of the people responding to Jesus. And so all the conversations have been about how people interact and respond to Jesus in different situations. So uh, we have a couple more weeks in this uh, series before we move on to something else. So um, I want to invite you to join me in the book of Mark. Again, that's the book of Mark. We'll be in two different chapters. We're going to start in chapter six. Hi, Alita. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're going to start in chapter six, but I do want to start with a word of prayer, if that's all right with you all. So let's get settled, get your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter six. We're going to take a couple of deep breaths, get started and have a little Bible study tonight. All right. I always try to tell people before we start Bible study, and I've been doing this since I've had to be virtual, is you need to take a minute to clear your heart, clear your mind, set your space so that you are ready to receive, ready to learn, ready to um, just hear the word God with fresh ears. I know oftentimes we review scripture or hear scripture over and over, and we sometimes don't see something new in the text. But if you take the time to clear your head, clear your heart and your mind, just maybe you'll see something different or hear something different in the text for today. Hey, Miss Tamara, thank y'all for hanging out with me tonight. So let's go ahead and get started with a deep breath in through your nose. I'm gonna count to five. I breathe different because I gotta count and breathe. All right, in through your nose, count of five. One, two, three, four, five. Exhale, one, two, three, four. Five. If you need another deep breath, go ahead and take it. We have not done this in a long time. And that's, we're going to do some shoulder rolls. I know you're trying to figure out why in the work are we doing these centering breaths and these shoulder rolls? Well, it's to get us ready for Bible study, to get us ready to clear our hearts and our minds so that we can focus on the word. So let's take your right shoulder. I think I just pointed to my left. It's my right. Roll it back. Ooh, and sit it down. And then we're going to do the same thing on the opposite side. Roll it back and sit it down. So, all right, we're up and tall. Our feet are planted on the ground, or if you want to wiggle your toes, whatever you need to get ready to focus. I'm going to start with uh, a word of prayer, and then we're going to go to Mark chapter six. So let me get my screen ready while you're getting your Bible ready. Ready? Let's pray. God, we thank you for this day and this evening and this opportunity. We thank you for getting us through today's journey. God, whatever we had to face today, whatever we had to experience, we thank you that we are still standing and that we made it through. 
God, help us to clear away any confusion, clear away any chaos, clear away anything that is a distraction so that we hear and receive a word from you. God, speak. Your children are listening. And God, ask that you show us something new in the text and show us what to do and how to love others. It is in Jesus the Christ's name we pray. And we all say, amen. Amen, amen. Let's welcome the pastor seating. All right. I'm going to go ahead and read Mark chapter six. We're going to be focusing on verses 45 through 52. Again, that is Mark chapter six, verses 45 through 52. I'm going to read it in its entirety. And then I'm going to start with a couple of questions and we'll see where the Lord leads us tonight. Y'all ready? All right. Mark chapter six, beginning at verse 45. I said, are y'all ready? But I wasn't ready. Sorry about that. All right. This is a familiar text. This is right after Jesus um, has fed the, is it 4,000 in this one? 5,000 in this one. Uh, so in verse 45, it reads, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were afraid. Immediately, he spoke to them and said, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. All right, so that was Mark chapter 6, 45 through 52. All right. My first question um, for tonight is, what do you see, feel, or hear in the text? What pops out to you first in this particular text. Go ahead and put in the chat. We welcome our uh, folk from YouTube as well. Uh, you'll be able to see their comments on the screen as we continue. What do you see, hear, and feel pops out for, to you in this particular text before we dive deep to the text. Fear. Okay, Tamara, I see you. They are afraid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What else shall I got for me tonight? Uncertainty. All right. Thank you. While others are, are putting things into the chat, I want to remind you just that just above the scripture, just above where I read from 30 to about mm, 44, we are um, witnessing or privy to the miracle of Jesus feeding the 5,000. The disciples have been with him. Um, they have been learning. Thank you, Melita. They have fear them. And they have done this, they have watched this miraculous moment. Jesus sends them on another mission. Good evening, Tasha. And sends them over to another uh, place after they have witnessed a miraculous moment. It is after they've witnessed this 
that they are on the boat, riding the boat, and a storm comes a brewing. And during the storm, Jesus sees, while Jesus is off praying, Jesus is on the mountainside praying, Jesus can see them as they are struggling to control this boat. They're struggling to um, hold on to the oars. They're struggling to manage the the, the waters. Uh, they're struggling to handle maneuvering this boat on this lake. And so Jesus begins to walk out to them. Jesus begins to walk onto the water. How do you think you would have felt had you been the disciples who have been sent on assignment by Jesus and now you're in the middle of a storm? And Jesus is nowhere to be found. Pastor C, feel free to chime in anytime. And how would you feel? You have been sent on assignment. And Jesus is not there. Jesus has sent you, told you to go somewhere. And the storm begins to brew. And it's a bad one. Mm -hmm. And Jesus ain't nowhere to be found. While y'all are typing in, I also want to acknowledge. Oh. Tamara said, I honestly, I would honestly be afraid and feel let down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, many of you have heard me tell the story, especially if you've heard me preach for a long time, um, about my fear of thunderstorms. Melita said disappointed. Uh, Bria said scared. I was terrified of storms. I don't know why I was terrified, but knowing that someone could protect me from a storm or in my head comforted me during the storm and they weren't there, almost felt like neglect, right? Um, and so I, I imagine these disciples are headed on this assignment, sitting in the boat, experiencing the storm, and they're they're trying to hold on to the oars. They're trying to, now this is not a motorized boat. They are trying to hold on to these oars. And they feel like, well, where is Jesus now? Why would Jesus send us on an assignment? And why would Jesus send us out here if Jesus knew a storm was going to happen? And where is Jesus when we need him? Mm -hmm. But on the flip side, Jesus is in the mountainside praying. And oftentimes when we think about Jesus being disconnected from the disciples praying, and yet at the same time they are experiencing a storm, oftentimes we begin to think of or can feel like the disciples that we've been neglected, that we've been abandoned, that we're disappointed, that we are scared, we may feel like we're let down, like you put me on this assignment and now where are you? But we too have been the disciples. We too have been placed on assignment. We too have had ministry moments where we feel like, God, you told me to do this. Why is it so hard? God, you gave me this job. Why is it such a scary moment for me? God, you've told me to do this, uh, this experience or whatever the situation may be. And yet you find yourself feeling like, now where are you, God? Have you been there before? Pastor C, have you been there before? Any comment? All righty. So 
anyway, um, they are on the boat. They're headed on assignment. Amen, Tamara. They're on the boat headed on assignment. They feel like they can't hold on through this storm. They're feeling like they're abandoned and neglected. They know that Jesus has sent them on this assignment. And yet they are out there all by themselves. And even though they're not alone because they have other people with them, you can be in the presence of people and still feel all by yourself. Mm -hmm. You can be in the same space with people and still feel neglected, abandoned, and all by yourself and afraid. They can't bring you comfort because they have no more power than you do. And yet we look at the disciples quite often as the ones who never could understand where, who Jesus was, how Jesus responded. And oftentimes people judge the disciples like, okay, so you're in this boat. Y'all know Jesus is not going to let you, you know, just abandon you. Why are y'all panicked? That's easy to say <laughs> from the outside looking in, but let's be truthful. If we're the ones sitting on that boat, if we're the ones experiencing the storm, if we are the ones who are having to handle this all by ourselves, we, we would panic if we didn't know if Jesus, when Jesus, why Jesus, we don't have the answers. We're just experiencing this moment of being by ourselves or with someone who has no more power than you. And you're experiencing this for a moment, wondering, Jesus, where are you? Jesus, why am I experiencing this right now? You sent me on this assignment. Why are you not here? So before we sit in judgment of the disciples, like many times we do, and wonder how did they not get it that Jesus is watching, Jesus is going to take care of them. We too are guilty. We are guilty of having those moments when God has put something on our hearts or led us to do something or um, let down a path that when it becomes difficult, when the waters begin to uh, uh, crash and the waves uh, get a little stirred up or the winds begin to blow or it makes it more uh, complicated or challenging, we too have moments where we are afraid. We have moments where we go, where are you, God? We have moments where we feel like, is Jesus... <laughs> Who Jesus says he is. And we have a Bible to go by. They, these men had nothing but their eyewitness account of what Jesus had done and is doing. So in the midst of their fear, they have gone through the storm. They've been riding this boat. And the Bible says shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. This is the one thing I'm going to be honest and tell you that I've skipped him many times. Verse 48 says, he was about to pass by them. Now, Jesus, if I'm on this boat and a storm is happening, why does it say that you were about to pass me by like you didn't know I was out here? Because <laughs> it's not about that. The fact that you're still straining at the oars means that you're still struggling, that you're still there. The fact that you're still pushing through and persevering shows that you are accomplishing the mission, regardless of how it may feel at the time. And so when Jesus intends to pass them by, it's because the fact is they are still making progress, even though it is in adverse winds. And often people forget prior to this, Jesus shows you does a performs a miracle to be accompanied by a message and the disciples totally missed it. So here it is again. He tells them to go ahead. He has been telling them, come, come. They've been seeing everything that Jesus does. But then all of a sudden, when Jesus says go, they don't know how to respond to go. They've been responding to come. It's comfortable. Come follow me. Come listen. That's OK. But as soon as Jesus says go, all of a sudden, all the maturity that they had gained seems to cease in the midst of adverse winds. And so when Jesus says he or the writer says he intended to pass them by, Jesus knows everything. Jesus sees them struggling, but the intended to pass them by wasn't because what we would project into the passage that Jesus doesn't care. 
it's more so to say that Jesus sees that they're still alive. Jesus sees that they're still in an okay space, even though it's adverse. They are still moving forward, regardless of how pleasant or unpleasant the situation may be. So I can see why Mark will say he intended to pass them by, because through life, adversity will happen. At some point, yes, we want God to be there with us. However, we should be comforted and assured in the notions that what God's word says about his creation is that we can overcome anything that comes our way, even if there is no physical presence of God or a move of God at that moment. All righty. I do like how you acknowledge that um, Jesus knows that they are struggling, but yet Jesus sees that they are managing through this storm and how... Um, if we apply that to our own lives, we see that as all well, that Jesus sees our moments where we are struggling or our moments where we are facing adversities, yet we are able to um, still manage those moments and still be able to make it knowing that Jesus has already equipped us. And I started off this lesson talking about how that miracle takes place right before this happens. So Jesus does the miraculous in front of them, sends them on assignment. And it's almost as if for a moment, they forget that the miraculous has just happened. And if Jesus was able to do the miraculous, then Jesus is still able to do the miraculous again, if they are willing to be patient and wait on Jesus. I think sometimes when we're going through situations, it is difficult to remember that Jesus did it before and Jesus can do it again. I think sometimes in the midst of our storms, we are so focused on holding on to the oar, holding on to um, what is tangible that gives us comfort and security that we forget or just don't make space to remember, not intentionally, but because of our chaos, we may forget that God is still with us, even in the midst of the storm. And I know it is hard to focus on God's presence in the midst of a struggle, but I think it is taking that time and that moment to remind yourself, I may be in this boat with my homeboys and it may feel like we are um, in a storm that is never going to end. However, God is still very much present because Jesus has been teaching us who Jesus is. Jesus has been teaching us to walk by faith. Jesus has been showing us all the miraculous. And for once in this boat by ourselves, we've got to lean and depend on the lessons that were taught to us, the things that we've witnessed, the moments that we've encountered, even before we're ever rescued. Because guess what? If we're not rescued, Jesus put us on this assignment. So therefore we're going to finish the assignment, right? Jesus has told us to go somewhere. So now that we are in the action of going, it's okay if the winds blow. 
it's okay if the water gets a little choppy because ultimately Jesus is still in control. Jesus is still leading us and guiding us and using us even when it's uncomfortable. I think for me, um, my fear of storms was the uncertainty of what was going to happen in the storm. Like me um, as a child going, okay, so I heard thunder, is lightning coming next? Like, will the lightning strike something? Like this uncertainty of, of what is about to happen or what could happen. And I wonder, is that a moment for them sitting there experiencing this storm, experiencing this moment of trying to, you know, can't walk by faith in a boat, but but uh, but paddle this boat by faith, trusting and believing that Jesus is still with them. The scripture says he was about to pass them by, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost and they cried out because they were terrified. This is the moment I love. When they cry out because they can't identify Jesus. I'm sorry, I'm about to sneeze. y'all. They can't identify Jesus. They think that this is a ghost. They're about to cry out. They cry out because they are afraid Jesus immediately speaks after they cry out. The scripture says immediately he spoke to them, right? So Jesus knew they were afraid, but when they opened up their mouths to speak out and, and cry out as if they were in fear and cry out as if they needed help, cry out um, because they were afraid, Jesus responds immediately. This makes me wonder how often do we ride in the storms or through the storms of life and not willing to cry out be because we don't know what to do or why we don't cry out when we're going through things. I think about how when we're going through tough times, sometimes we suffer in silence. We can be afraid in the room with everybody else who's afraid, but too afraid to speak up and say something about it. It does not tell us that there was a conversation on this boat. It does not say that one disciple looked at the other disciple and said, look here, I don't know what's happening, but we got to figure out how to make it through this. None of that is recorded. What is recorded is they saw something on the water, didn't know what it was, thought that, that it was a ghost. And so they cried out because they were terrified. In their moment of fear, in their moment of terror, they cry out. I wish we knew the words that they said, but they lift up their voices. And as soon as they lift up their voices, the Bible says immediately he spoke to them and said, take courage. It is I, don't be afraid. I think there is power in lifting up your voice and saying something. I think there is power in lifting up your voice when you are afraid. Tamara said, I do that trying to be the brave one and I'm screaming on the inside. And guess who's suffering, Tamara? Because that internal cry is it really being heard, right? So nobody can help you if we don't know you crying. Their willingness to lift up their voice and cry out, even in the midst of fear, Jesus moves and checks on them and responds to them. Any comments, Pastor C? All right. All right. So it says, then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. So once Jesus gets in the boat, guess what happens? Wind stops blowing. <laughs> so you're like, well, okay, Jesus, you could have done this 15 minutes ago. <laughs> you could have just stepped on into the boat 15 minutes ago. But anyway, as soon as it happens and they see that the wind adjusts to Jesus, because that is what's happening. As soon as he gets into the um, boat with them, the wind died down and they were completely amazed. 
for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. So that goes back to something you said earlier, Pastor C, that it wasn't about um, any of that. It was about the the miracle that happened before they got into the boat. Do you want to elaborate on that? Well, I mean, they feared that there wouldn't be any provisions made for the people that were hungry. And they were questioning whether or not that that would be. And that's, that's all I was meaning by that. Nothing uh, deep or profound, just they hadn't paid attention to their fears then were limiting the power of Jesus at that moment. And so here they are again. And now that Jesus isn't in the boat prior to this, Jesus is in the boat every time they get in the boat. The last time that they were in a boat by themselves is when they were handing, uh, tending to their occupations. And so now they're in this boat. And with all the things that have taken place, they're not, they're not, they're not content. They are not steadfast in the moment of until Jesus gets back in the boat. When I believe the fact that they, they miss that Jesus told them to go and collect all they to excuse me jesus tells the little boy to put the fish in his hands they missed it where jesus provides for them that fear of being provided for was was subdued by jesus performing the miracle and then not only that whenever he tells the disciples to go and pick up the leftovers of it they didn't understand that the abundance of the provision the abundance of what jesus is able to provide for got his people they'd missed all of that. And so now as they get, they're astounded. I think Jesus is more offended by the fact that they are astounded that the wind, the wind stops blowing as soon as he gets in the boat. I think it's offensive in faith and not and hear me. Well, I'm not saying that you shouldn't offend Jesus or God. I, I think God is big enough to handle the offenses that you had. Hello. We're still, we're still here. Um, but I think Jesus is uh, is offended because of the fact that when they get in the boat, all of a sudden when the wind stop, they're astounded. I think what happens is whenever we go through our trials and mo not saying that our, all of our trials are always the same, but I think it is almost an offense to God when we are freaking out. Fear is necessary. Fear tells you to look across the street both ways before you cross the street. Fear tells you that eye on the stove is hot. Speaking from my own personal experience, that eye is hot. Please don't touch the stove. Fear is necessary. Fear breeds caution so that way you don't put yourself into a, into a compromising position. But I think when we start to become afraid, I think that takes it to another, and I know those terms can be used synonymously, I think when you become afraid, it's almost like you become numb. You forget what is able to happen by the happen by the presence of God. And so when there's they say they're astounded, or Mark says that they were astounded, I think it was almost offensive to Jesus because Mark clearly let, clearly let us know they didn't understand what happened before. They thought Jesus was just working magic, doing miracles. They missed the message. I would say, oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. They missed the message. So when you're going through and you have these moments where you're going against adverse winds in your life, if you miss the message from the last trial that you went through and now you're straining at the oars of life, you got adverse winds hitting you from each direction. It is hindering your progress. I think what we glean from this particular study is if you miss the message from the last time you were going through something, then you won't be able to. I think it's offensive to God or in this case, Jesus, because God has shown us before the message of how to handle these situations. And so I feel like there is any time we don't learn from the previous deliverance, anytime we don't 
uh, learn from the previous redemption, anytime that we don't learn from the previous covering, the, the saving grace of God or the saving mercy of God, and then all of a sudden we're astounded or in awe that God has been able to do something, I think it becomes offensive to God in the sense he can handle it, God can handle it, but I think it becomes offensive. And so when we don't understand or come to understand when we went through the last time, God provided for us the last time and we don't take it, make note of it, catalog it. I think it's offensive after that. And when we get to that next trial and now we're sitting here and we've gone beyond fear, it's almost an ungodly fear. And now God has to come in and be like, did you not know? That's good. That goes back. Um, for me, it reminds me of um, the story that many preachers talk about or the, the analogy that many preachers talk about of if you don't pass the test the first time, you're going to take it again, right? Um, the fact that they have experienced God, provide Jesus providing the meal, which is nourishment, in the midst of not having very much to, to use, and now they're in a situation where they need God to provide or Jesus to provide something new. Do you think it it is the fact that it's not something tangible that they need Jesus to provide, that maybe that's why they missed a point? So like in the in the first um the scripture before this, Jesus is providing a tangible meal. Jesus is taking bread and breaking it and, and multiplying it. So that's something you can see. That's something you can touch. That's a tangible um, miracle. Do you think the issue is while they're in the boat that they are not really connecting the two lessons because that's not a tangible um, thing that Jesus is going to have to produce? They're in a storm. So is it that they can't wrap their minds around the fact that Jesus can calm the winds? Because they're used to tangible things that they can see Jesus do, things they can touch, they can taste. But this is a different experience for them. This is a storm, right? This isn't, oh, I'm hungry or I'm, I'm thirsty um, or I'm sick and you're, 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 you're touching my body and you're touching the bread and you're providing for me in that way. This is different. This is this is the, the atmosphere around me. This is nature around me causing the storm. I wonder, is that the issue for the disciples that they're just not able uh, to apply that same lesson that they learn about God, that being Jesus being the son of God and Jesus being able to provide the bread and, and enough and allowing that to multiply. They've witnessed other miracles, but I'm wondering is it that this is not a tangible miracle that they can comprehend? Because they don't even really know what they need. They don't know if the storm needs to end. They don't know if the water needs to calm down. Like they don't really know because they're in the midst of a storm, right? And so I wonder, is it that it's not a tangible thing that they can comprehend that Jesus can still move in this? Does that make sense? But the, the, all those other things weren't about something tangible. They, they, I think that is where, where people and faith collide is that we think it's something tangible that that something tangible, something that can be touched, felt, that makes God who God is. God does not need objects, materials money to prove that God is God. God does not need, God has blessed me with a wife, but God didn't need to bless me with a wife to show that God is God and vice versa. God didn't need to bless me with a house to show me that God is God. Those are the blessings that just come with the territory of being and having faith in God. I think what happens is and with the disciples in this moment, and we we can place ourselves into these same situations, is none of these things were based off um, the tangible goods. Jesus is trying to um, Jesus is trying to get them to understand 
who he is in the narrative, but he's also trying to un- get them to understand the very, the very spirit that's within them. And so that's the big that's thing. The big thing. That's the big thing. That's the big thing that uh, I believe that disciples then and disciples presence miss. We we get that monetary blessing from God. And then all of a sudden we're like, oh, God is blessing me. But the moment that that very monetary thing runs out or goes away, all of a sudden we find ourselves back in that stressful situation when our focus should not be on the thing. Yes, God fed 5,000 people, not including the women and the children, but that wasn't, God can take little and turn it into more. Same thing whenever Jesus is talking um, or he uh, does the miracle with the wine, it wasn't necessarily about Jesus going into the moment of trying to to save the party is Jesus can take something that is lifeless and give it life. Like Jesus is more so than preaching the miracles is the message is more important than the actual miracle itself. The miracle is almost just like a visual display of what he's trying to say or what he's trying, the message he's trying to get across to the point. And then like, for instance, like I struggle with the disciples here in this passage because you've been on a boat before. You, you, you've been on a boat before. You were fishermen. Most of you were. You were fishermen. You've been on boats before. You've had to reel in heavy nets of fish and potentially even had to put the nets back in the boat because of the potential storms out on the seas. You've been here before. And so I would even say, if I'm just having a moment to be theologically imaginative right now, is you've been in these situations before. You've gone through a trial before. You've gone through tribulations before. And so I feel like that's where when we're reading this passage, it's the offense is you've been here before. You've got you've gone through this before. You've seen all the things that you've been able to when you stopped fearing. I've given you an image of how you should be resting in the midst of your troubles, your trials. But the disciples had not learned from any of those messages from the miracles that Jesus had performed before. And I think that's something for us to learn or for us to, yes, for us to practice, because it's not something we're going to say all oh, Pastor C, Pastor Latanya said, we got to, we've been here before. We've got to just handle it. No, I think the practice makes pro- progress is what we're looking for. And the disciples missed it up until this point that we read in Mark. I wasn't even thinking about the fact <laughs> Again, I wasn't even thinking about the fact they're fishermen. They've been here before. They should know what a storm feels like. They should know that they've made it through storms on water before. I, I my brain, and many of you may be <laughs> in that moment with me, that I just totally forgot that they are used to being on water. And so if they're used to this, the environment, what makes this so different for them? And of course, we may not, we don't have the answers to everything, um, but I don't, I do want to push us a, a little bit um, past where we left off. Jesus says, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down and they were completely amazed for they had not understood about the lo- the loaves and their hearts were hardened. Um, the text, the, the book that we're using takes us to Mark chapter eight, where we're seeing a repeat of the miracle again, right? This miracle, um, and I don't know, Pastor, you want to go ahead and jump to there? Or you want to just stay where we are now? Um, the scripture jumps to Mark chapter 8, 1 through 21. That's where the, uh, the lesson takes us. It's the next miracle of feeding again, right? So <laughs> thank you, my joy. I am I'm so happy that I'm not the only one that went, oh, I forgot. Some of them were fishermen. They they should know what to do when they're in this boat and, and they're freaking out. And dude, y'all been here before. <laughs> y'all had storms on water before and, and you, you know, you made it through. Um, so anyway, the text, the textbook that we're using or the lesson book that we're using takes us to um, Mark chapter eight. If y'all want to flip there. Mark 
chapter eight and it goes one through 21. It tells the story of a different um, moment of feeding and we can um, talk about that and slowly wrap up. Uh, it says in Mark chapter eight, beginning at verse number one, uh, during those days, another large crowd gathered and since they had nothing to eat, Jesus calls his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a distance. His disciples answered, but where in this remote place can anyone get enough food, excuse me, enough bread to feed them? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied. He told them to sit down on the ground. And when he had taken the seven loaves of thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. And they did so. They had a few small fish as well. He gave thanks for them also and told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and were satisfied. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 were present. After he had sent them away, he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the region of Dalmanua. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus to test him. They asked him for a sign from heaven. Uh oh, my joy, there's that sign. He sighed deeply and said, why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to it. Then he left them, got back into the boat and crossed to the other side. So this is almost a replay of Mark chapter six. Um, they are experiencing this um, same kind of moment, um, basic moment of people have, people have followed Jesus. The people have been there so long they get hungry. The disciples complain about either the cost of feeding them or they don't have enough to feed them. They don't try to come up with a solution, but they have plenty to complain about. Haha, <laughs> sounds like folk we know. And Jesus has compassion. And then Jesus asks for the disciples almost participation in each one of these because he asks in both situations, how much do you have? Once Jesus is presented with what is present, what they have, Jesus gives thanks. He breaks the bread and feeds everyone. Why is it necessary for this story to be repeated again? Pastor C, why is it necessary? From Mark 6 to Mark 8, it is almost an identical story. Different regions, different, different you know, neighborhoods, same kind of miracle. Why is it necessary to retest the students who struggle the first time? The big piece of faith is honestly, and not to make light of any situations, trials may differ, tribulations may differ, but our response to the trials and tribulations should never change. I think I think if we truly embraced and once again this is easier said than done I think if we truly embrace human suffering and I'm going to change that to human challenges faced mm -hmm. then if we truly embraced it, then we wouldn't find ourselves in these same positions where it, not that God sends tests, but God is God and God's sovereign. So God can do whatever God wants to do with each and every one of us. So if God chooses to allow a, the test to come and the test be somewhat identical to the previous test, I think it is indicating to us that maybe we just didn't glean something from that last time it happened to us. And so once again, this isn't the first time that this has had to happen with people who are community of faith. 
the whole reason why we have Deuteronomy is because it was the second time that the law was going to be given to the children of Israel. God gives it in Exodus and then Deuteronomy, he's got to do it again because that 11 day trip turned into 40 years. And so here Jesus is doing somewhat like his father did. And he's twofold showing to the people who he is. But then he once again is seeing if those same questions rise back and rise up from the disciples, those who have been following with him closely for how many ever, however many years that they're following with him at this point, too. And one of my favorite movies, and I, it's crazy that I had not seen this movie since I went and saw it the first time, the movie Red Tails. Um, one of the most profound parts and one of the things that I kind of like try to keep in my in the forefront of my memory is that there's some point that they're getting ready to go fly or they're flying. And one of the top pilots says, uh, or the captain, I think that's played by Terrence Howard. He says that experience gives the tests first and then the lesson. And I think often when we go through here testing, when we don't know if God is going to provide previous, whenever we're in rocky situations, we go through the experience feeling like we're lacking when maybe it was to test how we responded they saw previous things, but for us to learn and to gain wisdom going forward. And so I feel like that's why we see this poke its head back out with another feeding in it, you know, indicating because Mark is trying to show who Jesus person really is with these passages he writes about. I totally agree with that. Um, this, uh, the feeding narratives of, that we've taken a look at, both of them, you know, although the disciples may have missed the lesson or it didn't pass the test, right? I think we too have missed miracles in our own presence, right? I think about like this whole feeding uh, moment how many have the testimony of watching their mother, or their great grandmother, or someone in their family take a little bit that should not be able to feed a family um, and watch them worship and pray while they cook. And, and they see that this little bit stretches out to so much more, to be more than enough. Like I, I know I've, I've heard stories from both of my parents of, they, they watch their, their parents take the little bit they had and feed all of their children. Yet, I wonder, although we witness those things, I witnessed my grandmother cooking and praying and that little bit fed so many people. I wonder, do we also miss those moments of the miraculous in our own, um, in our own lives? And I know I'm not trying to compare our grandparents or, or any of those um, those that we love to Jesus, but those moments of God providing more than enough, of God making a way out of no way, that we miss those miraculous moments in our day-to-day -day lives or those experience that, experiences that we were blessed to witness or be a part of. And yet when we have hard times, let's say financially, or let's say we can't find a job. Let's just say we're going through these different moments that we almost like the disciples forget that we watch God do the miraculous. We watch God make a way out of no way. And if God did it, then that same God with grandma and whoever, big Ma, however you want to name that person, that same God that was with them as they prayed and made sure that that little bit stretched to more than enough. That same God that was in that kitchen, that same God that was um, was filling them with the Holy Spirit is the same God that makes a way for us to, that still does that miraculous for us. But yet we forget because our circumstances, our situations, our moments are different. It doesn't feel the same, right? You know, it doesn't, we're not feeding eight children with, you know, a, a loaf of bread and whatever. We, it may not be the same 
thing, but it's the same mindset of God being more than enough and providing what we need and being present in every situation. So we too miss the mark of watching uh, the miraculous and still not being confident in our weaknesses or in our moments of challenge that that same God can make a way for us to. That's just what hit me with as as you were talking that you know sometimes we too miss we miss the lesson um, just like the disciples. I think we get so caught up that we miss the lesson. Mm, mm, mm. Anything else you want to say, Pastor C, before we close tonight? No, ma'am. All right. I want to encourage each one of us, not just you, <laughs> but each one of us to take the time to appreciate the miraculous that happens in front of us daily and to reflect on our moments of watching God manifest and move in our lives, that even when we are in the midst of our own struggles, when we're in the midst of our own moments where we feel like the waves are crashing and we feel like the wind is blowing and we feel like we're all by ourselves, even when we feel like that there may not be a way out or we feel like we have been abandoned, forgotten, and that Jesus is not present with us, to hold on and take a moment to take a deep breath, reflect on those things that you've seen God do before, reflect on those miraculous moments that God made a way before, that same God that made a way then, is the same God who's still present with you right now. So you may be experiencing a storm in your life. And maybe you've been experiencing several storms. We want to encourage you. And God is still present. And maybe you just didn't see the miraculous clearly. Maybe you're not acknowledging the lesson that you should have learned. But God is still present. And God is still moving. Thank you for hanging out with us tonight. If no one has told you today, let us be the first to say, we love you and so does the Lord. God bless you and we'll see you Sunday morning.